like it was like a beautiful dark blue. We, we still didn't see anything, but it was so peaceful. 360 degrees, you see nothing. You hear nothing. And it's just beautiful. It, and I, I had a moment where I felt so proud of myself. In that moment where I saw nothing, like there's no reef, there's, you know, if, if I drop my camera, that's it. I'm not seeing it anymore. If I lose sight of the guides, that's it. <laughs> I don't know where they are anymore. But I felt really proud because I just felt so comfortable. It was natural. The, and here I am, cocooned by beautiful, unpainted forestry. This is where I was meant to be. And even though my feet were hurting, I had faith that I had to keep on going. And so this was where the mental resilience, the emotional resilience, the psychological resilience, the spiritual resilience started setting in. It felt like for it felt like no matter how low I went, and I went so slowly, I could hear the waterfalls, but it seemed like I could never reach the bottom. Like, and that whole hour, I felt like I was just in tears. I was going to burst into tears for two reasons. Because number one, my feet were in so much pain. I just wanted it to be over. Number two, because there was so much pain, I had to move so slowly. And I think that was the part that hurt me the most. It was, I couldn't bear to move this slowly. The message that I got when I was going down to get to the waterfall and I was on the brink of tears, the message that I got was, Andy, can, can you let this be enough? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my dear listeners and followers of this show and newbies to this Oliver Shirach show. I'm Oliver the host and today it's the long-awaited part two with Andrea Fung. We had a very long discussion, conversation, interview in October 23 and I finally got through both episodes and here in the second episode it's more about her adventures in nature. Is it deep diving into the blue ocean looking for sharks and ending up in the uh, complete silence or being in the super humid heaty Malaysian natural jungle where her feet are hurting you get her storytelling about how these nature adventures have helped her to connect more back to herself and realizing that nature is an important part of her life and what these different adventures have taught her spiritually personally and how she was growing from the there's synchronicities, there's aha moments. Uh, we also go into the menstrual cycle. She's very open. I was a bit surprised. And yeah, what else? Yeah, it's a lot of talk, but this one is more about nature, adventures, and how this interacts with her growth as a human being, as a spiritual being, and how to connect more to yourself. I hope you're gonna enjoy it as much as I did. And without any further ado, welcome to part two. Now we are back from our short break, filling up the water. So we were just stopping before you said, let's share. And like, do you have another hour about your experience? <laughs> before uh, what, The jungle talked, track. The jump, we we um, connected and then you said, okay, we have to, you know, it, in about two weeks, we can have the podcast. So now it's like three weeks later because you went uh, on a jungle trip on a, I guess, yeah. self-finding or some kind of trip. No. So what happened? What was it? Was, it wasn't self-finding. It was just, it was, I just wanted to go on an awesome jungle trek. And this was like the hardest trek because it's to the lost world of Sabah. It's one of like the relatively few um, untouched forests left in the world. Oh, well, and that's and Malaysia. So, yeah. Yeah, in Malaysia. Yeah, in, in my state, uh, in my state of Sabah specifically. So, like, my state is very popular for ecotourism. We have the best diving spots, the best hiking spots, anything related to being out in nature, cocooned in nature, forestry, beautiful like wildlife animals, underwater animals. It's like marine life. That is what my state is really world renowned for. Wow. Okay. I uh, definitely. Yeah. Another pin somewhere for me uh, to 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 go and uh, experience. I need to hang. Oh yes, you must. I need to hang up that <laughs> world um, map. I have no idea where it is now. 
when I moved, I didn't put it up again. But I have like this mm -hmm. world map uh, for knowing where I want to go and where I have been. So I love nature. I love water. Um, yeah. So. Have you gone diving? Uh, once or twice. I don't have a, I don't have a certificate, but uh, I don't remember what was the depth. But we went down with a scuba diving suit. We went down. Uh, that was in France somewhere. Uh, out. There was a, a clip. Somewhere out, I didn't see the yeah. shore when we were from there. And we went, I don't know, four, ten meters, something like that down. And when yeah. we came home, there was like no um, messages that they they have spotted the white shark in that region, which is not so normal. Oh, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, but I was still, it, I was like 16 years old. So that must be like, wow, like almost 30 years ago. And... um Back then, I was. You should go diving. I was really get certified. I would have been really terrified seeing a white shark being underwater, right? <laughs> but now, <laughs> because of all the conditioning we have, like they are predators, they attack you. But thanks to YouTube and Instagram and all these, you get a lot of these videos with people diving with white sharks and touching them and mm. showing they're not just attacking just because you're in the water. So. Yes, yes. But that, that, They're attacking if they feel like you're a threat. Yes, and we sometimes are very good in doing that. So that that's yes. my last experience. Gee, like almost 30 years ago, I had the scuba diving stuff on. But I love to just go on the water with or without goggles and just, you know, float under the water. And when I'm really, really... Then tempted, you, should come, you should come here snorkeling as well. So there's a lot of... Um, what is it? A lot of fish or coral reefs or yeah, fish, coral. That the reefs. Yes, have you ever seen um, Finding Nemo? <laughs> yes. What was he swimming from and, and Malaysia you're... to Australia or what? <laughs> oh, he was just he was swimming from wherever he was to Australia. Well, <laughs> so so you know at one point where where he loses Nemo, there's like a drop off. Yeah. It's like the reef ends and there's a drop off. Yeah, to the open. So there's this place. So whenever I've gone diving, there's always, it's always been like a seabed or a reef, no matter how deep, right? But this time when I came back to Malaysia, it's when I, there's this really, there's a, this place called Tepadan Island and it's, it's world renowned. Like, you know, people come here from all over the world to go diving here. And it's like this huge reef and there's a drop off. And one of the, one of the parts of it is, they take you swimming 10 minutes away from there, from the reef. So you are just surrounded by nothing but blue, like dark blue. You don't see anyone oh, other than the people in your group. You don't see anything. You don't see what's above. You don't see what's below. And if, if, it, if it rains the night before, which is what happened on my first day out at Sipadan, it was, you're just in black. And that was terrible. That was a bit terrifying because you're just in black. And normally I wouldn't be that terrified. Actually, I'm not someone that scares very easily. But it was quite scary because as we were descending, I was wearing new goggles at the time and water started going in. Oh. And so you're trying to equalize as you're descending. And I'm trying to get all the water out, like blow it out. And at the same time, keep track of everyone around me as we're descending in blackness. So at one point, at one point, I was like starting to panic slightly. And I just kind of thought, should I tell this person? Should I tell the guy that, you know, I've got issues? But then I just kind of thought, no, nah, I, I came all the way here. I am not. I don't care if the whole for the next hour and a bit, my goggles are half filled with water. I am continuing. I am not backing up from this. So we just went and it was really lovely. It was such an... It was quiet out, out there. It was quiet. It was black. You don't really hear anything other than the breathing of your water. It's, it's like, it's like there is nothing and everything at the same time. Oh my God. So you, you just, <laughs> I, I visualize being there from a safe place of sitting here on the ground. And after just saying, I love going in the water and floating around. But now you're scared. Oh. Yes. Like um, <laughs> there's like this unease in me, right? Just imagining 
being there. So, so you've been diving before with scuba diving uh, equipment and everything, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With- it's not like I've gone. No, I didn't grow up with it. But like, I got a license. I think when I when I was a teenager, I was joining this like volunteer organization. Um, and you get part of it was like a you know you get a diving certificate and you learn how to dive and do a bunch of like other fun stuff and from that and then after that um, I didn't really dive that much until until when I think it was 2017 I wanted to go diving at the Galapagos Islands so I did that and then a few years ago I went diving at the Great Barrier Reef Uh, and now this time I'm diving at Sipada so I it's my aim that I want to go diving at some of the most amazing spots in the world because ah, uh, Earth is beautiful. Like I love Earth so much, and I love being underwater and being cocooned. And for me, being underwater feels that's my safe space. Like I feel very comfortable. I feel like I feel like I'm in the room of Gaia. You know? <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. Because you know, when you're also in the mother's belly there's like the water around you uh, yeah it's beautiful so now now i know you're not completely novice to it but you said you had like this little panic attack but when you're just surrounded by black you say you drive like 10 minutes away from the drop and then you're just in the black from the from the edge yeah uh so what did you do you you just descend into nothingness and that's what you do uh, just swimming around in the nothingness to kind of also, I think it's also like working on yourself doing that. I mean, being surrounded by nothing and just hearing the breath from mm. the bubbles and the water around you. Yeah. <clears throat> I, well, we were descending into nothingness because we wanted to go to the, to a particular depth, right? You know, when we go out, when we go up that far, it's to see if we could catch like hammerhead sharks or you oh, know, schools hammerhead of sharks. jackfish or some, yeah, or we could see schools of jackfish or whatever, or like who knows, we might see like a whale or turtles or whatever. So, um, so yeah, so when we were descending, we were going to descend to like maybe 20 or 25 meters or something like that. Um, so that's where the- I think at that time we were. And that's where this, the fish yeah. start to, when you go that deep, that's when they start to come up, uh, the sharks. and Yeah, yeah that's, where, that's where the sharks are. Yeah, around there, that's where the sharks are. And the deeper you go, you can see, the, you can find the sharks cleaning stations and stuff like that. Um, but normally away from the reef would be where you would be able to find those big like vortexes. You know, the big schools of, the big schools of sharks or the vortexes of fish, like the one that you see in those like, underwater documentaries yeah so we were looking for that we were looking for that yeah yeah, yeah. so i i did we didn't catch it at that time um we caught it like a, we caught it in another day it wasn't like a vortex but it was like a scroll but we were out hoping to see that um so i was i i didn't really have a panic attack but i was starting to panic yeah. it was more that and at that point it was like i had to make a decision am i going to tell the guide about it or am i going to just power through it and so I kind of thought, no, I'm going to just power through it. Like, I'll figure it out. But I, oh, this was the other belief. I never, I, I forgot to say, this is the other belief that has taken me through a lot of things. The first one is everything always works out for me. But before that belief came, it's I'll figure it out. I'll always figure it out. No matter what happens, no matter how terrible the situation is, I'll figure it out. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I definitely can see a lot of this masculine or fire energy in you like this doing I, yeah i can and the self it's kind of like self-belief so did did you yes. see anything there besides the blackness or was it just like that that experience was just the, the darkness and the little like well, how to that... overcome the panic like or the upcoming of a panic so not to mm-hmm. so that one we didn't see anything we were hoping to catch some catch some some sharks and stuff to see some sharks but we didn't see anything at that particular time but it was i'm glad anyway because i was busy i was busy getting comfortable i was busy getting comfortable with the goggles i was busy adapting to the blackness i was like busy 
um, you know, focusing on making sure I o- I'm always looking, making sure that my dive buddy and the guy is nearby. So I was, and I was just busy. So I'm kind of glad that nothing came my way <laughs> that day. So everything worked out anyway. But the next day, it was beautiful weather and it wasn't black. It was like a beautiful dark blue. We, we still didn't see anything, but it was so peaceful. Like this time my goggles were working. I was comfortable and it was just, you know, 360 degrees. You see nothing. You hear nothing. And it's just beautiful. It, and I was, I had a moment where I felt so proud of myself at that moment because I know and for, and for many other people, this would be really scary. It would be very disconcerting. They would feel very uncomfortable because as it is, most people feel quite uncomfortable being that deep underwater anyway. Um, but in that moment where I saw nothing, like there's no reef, there's, you know, if, if I drop my camera, that's it. I'm not seeing it anymore. <laughs> if I lose sight of the guides, that's it. I don't know where they are anymore. You know what I mean? So, but I felt really proud because I just felt so comfortable. It was natural. That there's a bit of a slight unease, but it's just due to unfamiliarity and also having that respect and honor for how huge the ocean is, how powerful the ocean is, and how amazing it is that you're swimming in its depths, you know? But yeah, overall, it was wonderful. Just uh, wonderful. Wow. So if yeah, you, you said many people would not feel comfortable being that deep. So as I said, I don't remember if I went four or 10 meters down and it was somewhere at the stone, so kind of a cliff. If, if, yeah. if you go down that deep, the 20, 25 meters, are you... Now, I, you're not like a super expert in diving, but... No. Would it be easier to do it where a reef is? Or how deep are reefs normally? Like 10 meters or? Yeah, you'll be able to see like reefs normally like 15. 15. F- like 15, 18. You'd be able to see reefs at that point. Yeah. 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 And then, um, I mean, so that's what people also would do is if they're uncomfortable in the open nothingness, where, where you mm-hmm. actually could see these big, big groups of fish and sharks, so then yes. it's probably easier to go where a reef is, where you go down. So Where the reefs are, yeah. You see the ground and just... Um, absolutely. So on, on the second day, there was a guy that was in our group. Um, he had, I think he, he had like a blocked nose. And you know how it's really important that you're able to equalize oh, yeah. at, every, at every level that you go down to. But I think he, because he had a blocked nose, he couldn't equalize his ears. So there was a max, he couldn't go below, I think, eight meters or something like that. So, but it wasn't fair to me because I can keep going and I want to keep going. So the guy basically said, look, just stay on the reef, like alongside us and we are going to go out and then we'll come back. I'll come and look for you afterwards, but we are going to go down a lot lower kind of thing. Yeah. So, but if And so that whole time he... He was really up there and I was really down. Yeah, but that was still at the reef or was that um, outside the reef? Outside and when we came back. Okay, super. Now, yeah. this is, what, what, what did all these different <laughs> diving experiences teach you in life generally? Did you see a change in your life afterwards because it went diving like this? I think... The diving, it really solid. I wouldn't. I don't say. I wouldn't say solidified. The trekking solidified. That the fact that I was meant to be outdoors. I think it reinforced each time. There was always like a another realization of how much I feel comfortable being outdoors. Like how much I love being outdoors. How how I feel so comfortable out in nature and I feel connected to the energy of nature to the energy of Gaia to the energy of Earth and this is something that I just took for granted I just assumed that most people are like that actually until I came to realize that I just was talking to one of my close friends two weeks ago and she was just like 
I mean, I'm happy to go out to the top of a hill to look at the views. And after that, I just want to be back in the car driving back to a restaurant or something like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And diving, hiking is like not her at all. Like she has, like she loves going shopping and she loves buying like, you know, classic, classic looking clothes and particular branded shoes and watches. And she tells me about all these things and I'm just like, cool. <laughs> and and like it's like I, I i struggle to feign interest and i, I will i'm interested because it looks good on her but like that just shows it highlights to me our differences and it highlights to me like wait hang on this thing that i assume most people do or that most people like it's not the case for most people it's actually not so yeah. That brings me, of course, like nature has so many different aspects. There's deserts, there's, as you said, the mm. open ocean, there's the coral reefs, yes. there's jungle, there's um, other old uh, forests, there's high mountaintops, Himalayas, uh, whatever, not. So you you now said you, you went to the jungle and it was not like a self, yes. it was not like a self-finding retreat. I thought first, perhaps you went out there just to, I don't know, do some gypsy healing stuff. <laughs> but you just went. I went out there because I just want to go for a jungle so trek. Did, did, you go, did you go alone or were you like a little group going in a jungle? Well, they joined me with a group. <laughs> and so I, because I'm traveling alone right now, um, I don't, the, the one or the two or three friends that I know here back home, they are not nature people. <laughs> like they're happy to go to the beach and sit down and chill and that and maybe a dip in the sea and and that's it <laughs> that, that's it so and this particular trek is one of the hardest treks that you could do here so and i just kind of thought you know what let's go do it let's, let's just do it for fun and i was i initially wanted to go end of august but then they said like, oh, there's no, there's no group going at the time. And if you were to go yourself, which you can go, you will have to pay like seven grand. And I thought, okay, well, what would be the price if I, if there was a group that I could join, just slide me into the group. And they said, oh, if you do that, it'll be like about 4,000. So of course I'm going to want to join a group, right? So wow. I got thought, okay, when's, yeah, when's the next group is gone? When's the next going? And they said, oh, it'll be like 10th to 14th of October. So this is like two months later than when I wanted to go but I knew I th I've come to realize now because I'm just going with the flow right I realized like okay if it is if the, the time is not meant to be end of August then there must be a reason for that and I'll just go you know at the time in October everything happens in divine timing and sure enough a lot of like shifts and you know transform like I was undergoing some shifts and transformative um, energetic movements around july august september so, so it was just as well that i couldn't make it there and by the time october arrived oh my god the group that i was in the synchronicity is insane so the group that i was part of it's just three of us it's me and a couple from switzerland so they spoke german to each other Yes, they spoke German to each other. The wife is from South Africa, but they obviously they've lived in Switzerland for many, many years now. And they are both in their 60s, right? But they're very fit to be in, they're very fit for people in their 60s. And they are like adventurers. So just last year, they summited Mount Kilimanjaro, you know? So what they have this thing that they want to do where they go from country to country and hike up the tallest mountain of country to country. So they've done the, the Tour de Mont Blanc. They've done like you know, all these other like camping trips going from, you know, um, going, I think like the West Highland in Scotland and they've done all these really cool things. And I feel so grateful that I got to meet them because like for as long, I've never, I've met many older people in their 60s, 70s and they're all like, you know, they're comfortable, they're rich, whatever. But I've never seen, um, I've never seen someone and or an older person, a senior citizen, exemplify or demonstrate the kind of life that I want to lead. So 
I always knew that I wanted to have a life of adventure, but I never really knew what that looked like. You know what I mean? Like, will I still be skydiving at the age of 70? Like, or something no. like that? Like, I don't know. <laughs> and and I never saw I never saw senior citizens doing that. I always see them on yachts or they're playing golf or they're doing like whatever, I'm like traveling the world, but it's very comfortable. And that's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, you do you. But when I met them, it, I felt my soul just come alive. It was like, I finally see for the first time a life, a life that I want to meet when I'm 60. I want to still be traveling the world and doing all these adventurous things when I'm in my 60s or when in my 70s for however long that I'm alive. You know what I mean? It, and it was so nice to see it for the first time that it's possible that my dream isn't crazy because no one no senior citizen that i know or that i've seen or that i know of has that kind of life or lives that kind of life i just never saw it i've never seen it it's not in my reality i don't know anyone who's like that i don't know anyone who knows someone who's like that you know so it, that in itself was already phenomenal for me so so now you're probably going to meet many more <laughs> which are well it's yeah probably i mean like if i keep booking myself in for these crazy treks or crazy trips then yeah because these are the only places that i'm going to meet them this is what it took for me to meet these people <laughs> and so what happened so i oh where do i even begin with this trek so we were assigned a guide this is okay this is i'm, I'm gonna now first talk about the synchronicity of this particular trip, okay? We were assigned a guide that spoke zero English other than hello. What? And obviously this, yeah, zero English. He has been working as a guide for two years. He spoke zero English other than hello uh, what, what, or good morning. But he's from Malaysia or where is he from? He's from Malaysia. So what? He's one of the natives here. Oh, native. So they have their own... So he's... Yeah, they have their own language and also like slang or dialect. And also he speaks Malay. He speaks Malay. But obviously, this Swiss couple does not speak Malay. And I have not been home in a long time. So I, and I don't have Malaysian friends in Australia. So I haven't spoken Malay in easily over 10 years. Easily. And since I've been back, I've been back six months, right? Any local person that I speak here, they think that I'm a tourist. They don't know that I'm actually from this city. Not even Malaysia. They don't know that I'm from this exact city. Yeah, because and so you have the Chinese and it's, uh, parents, so you're not a... But we have Chinese people here. It's multicultural. Ah. We have Malays, Chinese, Indians, the na and the natives. And that's because you're not speaking Malay, because you speak English. That's why they didn't realize. At and I think also the way I speak English has an accent. It's not like the Malaysian English. It's not, it's not Manglish, right? <laughs> so, and so I, and so this whole time that I've been here, I struggle to speak Malay because I don't feel comfortable speaking Malay. I don't, I can't remember the words. So coming back to this guide, it was like, so this, so this first couple and this guide would not be able to communicate if it wasn't because I was there translating. But I, my Malay is so bad. So you know what I mean? But because I'm placed in this situation, so I'm forced to, I'm forced to learn to speak Malay. <laughs> and I'm forced to learn to speak Malay so that I could be the glue to this group. So that's synchronicity number one. And I've been wanting to learn how to speak Malay. You know what I mean? And so now I'm forced in the situation to do it. So now I can actually do it. So every single day when I, when I speak to this guy, I struggle in every, in the first two days, in the, every sentence, I will be trying to search for the word. And I will be saying, I'll be asking Malay, oh, wait, how do you say this? Or what's the word for this? You know, the struggle is truly real. But what's really interesting is, is I think on the first night out at the camp, like this guy actually came to me. He said, can you teach me how to speak? to give the briefing in English. And so I taught him all the words like ascent, descent, breakfast, like what time do we leave? What time do we sleep? What time do we come back? How many kilometers? All this kind of stuff. And he, I made him practice it with me over and over and over and over again so that he can give the briefing in English. And so I asked him, I said, we've been doing this for two years. Like, why have you not learned how to speak English at this point? And he said, well, there was always someone who could do the translation for him. 
just just like me now, right? And then I said, okay, so what makes you want to learn how to speak English now? And he was like, no, I feel like I, I feel like I want, I'm ready to learn how to speak English and I want to speak English now. And so on the first night at the camp, after he was practicing, like he gave the briefing in English, he was so shy and so nervous. But the second night and the third night, he just came to us during dinner time and just gave the whole briefing. Didn't practice nothing. He just gave it all in English. And we were all just like so impressed. Because he spoke zero English. Zero. And now he's giving an entire briefing. Like, okay, we have breakfast at this time. We leave at this time. We are going to be trekking how many kilometers. And after we're going to descend how many kilometers. We're going to ascend how many kilometers. And then it will be even for how many kilometers. You know, how many, how many meters. And then we're going to arrive at the name of the next camp. All this kind of thing. He gave it all in English. And it was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> or great and uh, and yeah so for, for me it's like um also to understand now for you it's normal doing this jungle trip means you go from camp to camp mm -hmm. so there's like uh tents yes. there or wooden constructions or we live in like a wooden house with no electricity yeah so there's like wooden houses along yes path, and so you go from and then you have mm -hmm. to have a guide to do it you cannot do it on yourself no you're not allowed no, to go in by yourself not. and just walk so it's because it's an, it's if a, you get lost it's going to take like three days to a week to find you because there's no sign yeah you're like lost really lost <laughs> okay so, so yeah so you're guided you go from campsite and now that means you were three people for this tour plus the guide Three people and the guide, yeah. And and one porter that the Swiss couple decided to hire to carry all their stuff. Oh, so so they traveled light. <laughs> so he was carrying... So that they food. can travel light. Yeah, yeah. So I carried all of my stuff because I brought the bare minimum of what I think I need. Because I know that it could, it could be a hard trek. So I wanted to keep it as light as possible. But even then, they got heavier as time went on. But like, yeah. So, so it was just... Oh, uh, it's a long story. <laughs> it's such a long story. But, but like, coming back to the guide, like, it was a situation where this is what alignment feels like. When something happens in divine timing, when something is aligned, everyone wins. It's not just one person winning. Everyone wins. The guide was winning because he's learning how he's all of a sudden ready to speak English. I'm learning because I'm winning because I can now actually um, I, feel, I feel comfortable speaking Malay now. I'm also winning because I've met a couple that is an example of what I would like to be in the future. The couple is winning because now they, ha they understand what is going on every single day. There's a way to communicate with the guide. You know what I mean? And so, and all of this would not have, and you want to know how and why that Swiss couple even booked that trip? They were actually meant to be doing van life. They ordered like a caravan, like a camper van truck to be made so that they could do van life starting from Norway and slowly make their way down the continent, down the country to go to Australia. But the cre <laughs> but the person cre like building that van or that camper van told them that there was going to be a three month delay. So the husband was so angry that he decided to come to Borneo and book a bunch of trips. And that's how this particular trip happened. If he didn't book that trip, I would not be able to join this group. And if I was not able to join this group, he would not be able, they would have a very, very weird track of silence and frustration because the guy didn't know how to speak English. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, everything worked. Yes, everything happens just in divine timing. And when it happens like that, when it's fully aligned, everyone wins in a way that you cannot plan. You cannot plan it. You can't, ex you can't predict what kind of magic is going to occur in divine timing yeah and so the, the, this track through the jungle is like a five day or seven yes. day um it's five it's all up five days four nights but the first day we're arriving at the it's called the malia basin so we arrive at the study center where um you know we stay in like proper like like i would say we stay in like proper chalets and it's got air conditioning and stuff like that. But it's still wooden, but, and it's still out in the jungle, but it's still like proper accommodation. And then the next morning, then we get a, like, we get like a, uh, we get on like a four wheel drive that drive us to the first camp. 
and that in the morning, and that's when we start. So the first day, it was a 7.5 kilometer trek. And first three kilometers is, is ascent. It's nonstop incline. And then 4.5 kilometers, it's kind of like even undulating kind of, kind of journey. So the thing, the reason that the 3.5 kilometer, the reason this whole trek is so difficult is because it's not something you can train for in the gym because you are dealing with the heat. Mm -hmm. The moisture is so wet that you are sweating within, you are fully, your whole body is fully soaked within half an hour to an hour. And you're basically part of a wet t-shirt contest for the rest of the day. That's number one. Number two, you are sweating so much. Number two, there's also the heat because the sun is shining. So even though the temperature is not so bad because you're, you know, high up in the mount, you're like, yeah, kind of like high up and there's a, it's slightly misty and stuff like that. But it's the sweat. It's the sweat. It's the sun shining down. It's the fact that it rains every single night. So you're always stepping on muddy surfaces. No part is dry. And then there's the leeches. So can you imagine this Swiss couple, they've come here having to deal with all of that whilst climbing up three kilometers. And this three kilometers, it's like 75 degree, oh, 80 degree. That's nice. Angle. <laughs> yeah. So. And it's nonstop going up. <laughs> so, you, so it was just, it was, it was hard. That first day was hard. And, but what I realized that for me, and we're also carrying our backpacks as well. So I'm carrying eight kilos. So what I realized was I actually, I think it, I hike quite fast and I have to go at a particular pace because if I keep stopping or if I slow down, I get really tired really fast. So I have to keep on moving. So, but I know that you can only go as fast as your slowest hiker, right? Whether it's going up or going down. So I will go as fast as I can and then stop and then wait. <laughs> yeah, so that I mean, was day you, one. You talk, <laughs> I'm Swiss, right? So um, you, yeah. you said they were in Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc is France, Switzerland. So I've been on Mont Blanc. Yes. You can take a gondola and then you're up there. But uh, yes. you, can, uh, uh, you know, Swiss people are notorious. Not all, but I know so many people in Switzerland. They just go mountain hiking a lot, especially in the summer. And yes. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised they're not used to that. And then in Switzerland, you can also have like the 35, 40 degrees Celsius, but not the humidity. So it's like this. Yes. This, this, uh, you know, when yes. you go in the summer, you go up a mountain. I mean, I'm sure there's many people like, are you sure you want to go mountain climbing? It's 35, 40 degrees. Of course, in Switzerland, when you go up, it gets cold, um, higher up, right? Yes. It's the, uh, it's the mm -hmm. Alps and it's the highest mo uh, mountains range in, in Europe. But uh, the heat, yes. the humidity, I think that must be very hard. And so, so is yes. it like a circle that the, in the four days you were in the in the jungle, you just go back to where you started, or you're picked up somewhere else? So the first day we've gone from one camp to another camp that we stayed for for we stayed there two nights, and then we go to another camp, and then we come back to the original camp. So in a way, it's like a circuit. Yeah, it's like one circuit. Okay. But the only way you can get to each camp is to trek. There, there is, and that's why before we start the trek, they actually tell you to get travel insurance that allows for helicopter evacuation oh. because this, this is not an easy trek, like by any means whatsoever. It's not, there's no paved road. It's, you have to make sure you know where you're stepping. Make sure you're always stepping on the routes to get support. Make sure, you know, because otherwise you're going to be sliding down on the really, really steep hills because of the mud. And then there's leeches all over the place. So it is. And if, if at any point somewhere you sprained your ankle, yeah. there's, there's no way to get you out. The only way to do it is for the rangers to contact someone else. And then maybe eight guides come here with a stretcher to carry you to the next camp. And then maybe you can get the helicopter to come to arrive at the camp to get you out. That's the only way to get out. There's no other way. Okay. Yeah. So, but it's really, yeah. Going yeah. back to me. <laughs> so how was it for you emotionally, mentally, besides 
feeling in in this divine synchronicity by being there getting to know someone which lives the lifestyle you want to have when you're older or yeah. want to have from now on and being able to actually talk malai even though you were kind of holding against it for six months and helping him but, but being there in the nature in this rough environment again like when you were in the ocean nothing you look around you see nothing up and down everything is just dark blue or black and there's no sound. Yeah. And now you're going another extreme in jungle where it's always wet because it's always raining at night. And you have to be careful yeah. how you step because you could, you know, spray your ankle or do something bad. So how, yeah. what does it do inside you? Or what do, how do you feel? Oh, for that, I'm going to have to tell you the experience of the third day there. But on the first day, honestly... I felt like I was made for this. Like I, I, it was just this feeling of I, I, I am made for this because I see the Swiss couple. They're they're fit, like they're adventurous. You know, they've climbed more mountain peaks than I have. You know what I mean? You know, they've been outdoors. I think more than I have, and they were struggling. Honestly, the struggling with the elements, the elements that were just weighing them down so much, um, and. But one thing I noticed was like on the first day, I would touch a tree and I would literally feel the electric energetic transfer into my body and my heart would expand, my spirits would lift and it would be, I can keep going. That's how I felt on that first day. It was that I've never experienced something like that before. It was a phenomenal moment for me because it's like, this is how far I've come. With all the work on spirituality, unblocking my chakras, connecting, you know, strengthening my connection to all that is, to source, to earth. It's like confirmation that, wow, this is it. This is amazing that I get to experience this. How many people get to experience this? Not many, you know? Not, Not many people have this connection. Exactly, the connection. It's this being really centered. <laughs> and and being actually mm. able to feel it and i was like tree yeah. hugger and whatever not but so that was on the first or the third day you you were able to that was the f that was the first day so let me tell you the story of the third day <laughs> so what they told so you know how when you go on these trips they tell you make sure you wear proper hiking shoes stuff like that right so i thought <laughs> I what the shoes I have, it's like it's like gym shoes, but with really good grip. Cause I wanted to go hiking as well. But all the hikes I've been to, they've been relatively easy. Like, well, not not to say that they are so easy, but easy enough that if you have grippy sneakers, very grippy sneakers, it could work. But this time, no, because there was so much descent, ascent, descent, ascent. For example, on the second day. We had a, we were going to visit waterfalls. We had a 700 meter descent, by the way, which doesn't seem like a lot. 700 meters is like, so what? Right. But this descent was so steep that Marcus fell twice. Gail fell once. Like sometimes they were like, you know, those ladders, those ladders, vertical ladders that you lean against the, where you lean against a wall or you lean against a roof, mm -hmm. those straight up vertical ladders. They're like, three or four of these ladders linked up together for you to go straight down. Like that's how steep this vertical, this like vertical ascent, a uh, descent was. Oh. And that was really, really hard. That was really, really hard. You don't really want to. Sit. Yeah. You don't want to sit. And, and when you're climbing back up, when you're climbing back up, like sometimes if you look straight, all you see is roots and earth and you are just basically like using both your hands and both your legs to climb back up that's it's like an 80 85 degree incline oh shit you 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 make me scared another time here in this uh part <laughs> two of our talk because just to, to have like this interim thing here yes um was it corona time Probably it was, yes. We we went we didn't get out of Denmark because of corona and you know insecurity. Yes. We went camping and we went to a region we haven't really been in Denmark where they have like this um it's not clay, kalker. 
you know, like this calco wall, yes. like up this steep walls. And so they had this mm -hmm. outdoor adventure park climbing and my daughter and my son, they just love climbing. So I yes. also went and there was, like you said, a staircase, uh, um, a ladder going pretty much straight up. I mean, it's trees and you go yes. there, you have, you, you're connected, right? Not like you, you're, you're yeah. connected on these metal things with straps and everything. So nothing really can happen. And I had to go yeah. up this ladder. It wasn't stiff. It was, you know, two ropes or, or metal wires Soft. with, with, uh, with the steps. Yeah. I could barely open my hands when I was two thirds up. I couldn't go back down anymore because I couldn't. And I wanted to go up and I had to really yeah. force my hands to open so I can go and grab and grab and then step up. Yes. And, and the ladder was not very wide, probably 30, 40 centimeters max. Very narrow. Yeah. And, yes. the, floor, the whole thing was moving with me climbing up. Uh, so yeah. I have no idea how I would feel. Uh, were the letters where you were at least stable? So when you went up, you could feel they're like mounted. So it's not kind of shaking because for me, this other thing was shaking. I could barely open my fingers. And that was probably only 15 meters, yeah. not 700. <laughs> Although, like, it's not so bad. Like, it's not just 700, like, all the way down. There's, like, certain parts where you can step. It, it's, it's, again, it's not, like, 90 degree all the way down. It's, I would say, 80, 85 degree incline with, like, certain parts where you can just keep stepping down. But if you just look all the way down, definitely it's, it's, it, it goes down. So it's, it's mounted. It's, like, linked together quite, quite tightly because it is, it's because it, they have to make sure that it is as safe. It, they have to make sure that it's as solid as possible because if anyone gets hurt, how are you going to get back up there? Yeah. Like they, they want to make sure, like they want to make sure there is an element of adventure there. That there is, it is hard, but it's not like it's impossible to do. Yeah. It can be done. You just have to take it as slow as you have to take it. And trust just be careful and just trust yourself. And it takes a lot of, if you want to talk about growth, it takes a lot of mental fortitude to, to keep going because it's difficult. It's hard. It's hard on the body. It, it actually is hard on the body. So for example, that 700 meter, I felt like even though the first day was hard, I felt like that 700 meter descent segment, I thought that was the hardest part of the two days because it was so steep. But we got to see the waterfalls and it was amazing. So coming now, I'm link. I'm going to link back to why the third day was so hard. So coming back to the shoes, my shoes are not hiking shoes, right? I said that it's just sneakers with really good grip. So my feet on both, both my feet were constantly sliding and hitting the front of the shoe. And so it got, it was, it was constantly hitting, constantly banging. And so by the end of that second day, I was, I was, my feet were in pain. It was a relatively short day because we trekked so fast, which was amazing actually. Um, and Marcus and Gail kept up so well. It's, it's really amazing what they did. Um, but by the time I got, I kind of thought, okay, if I just give it enough rest that day, even though it was in so much pain, I think like, I think I could make it to the third day. So the third day is the hardest day. The third day we trekked 16.5 kilometers. Wow. So 16.5 kilometers and it's like we, we get to, we have to track an X, X number of kilometers to get to the junction. I think, was it like maybe eight or nine or something like that? And then we, and then after that, five kilometers, 2.5 down, 2.5 up, and then we have to go to the next camp. So it was the longest day of trekking. Okay. Gail and Marcus, because they had fallen. They had actually said, we're not doing, we're not doing the trek on the third day. We're just going to go straight to the next camp. But this day, the reason the trek is so long is because we're going to see the Malia Falls. This is the biggest set of waterfalls in, in, in this loop. Like you can't, we've already visited the three falls the day before. So this is going to be like the coup de grace. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then I was like, are you sure? Are you sure you don't want to go? And Marcus was like, and this is what he said. We should tell you everything. I don't need to prove anything to anyone. I've already seen three beautiful waterfalls. 
And like, I, I understand that he just wants to get back in one piece. I get it. You know, I get it. So no judgment here. But I was thinking I did not come all the way here to not finish. And I think you've heard me say this a few times now. I did not come all the way here to not finish. I did not. I'm already at this point. So I'm going to go. So we trekked. I haven't took up my hiking poles. And at one point we were walking. We were trekking to get to this point called the junction. This, the junction is an area of space that was leech central. Like the ground was just crawling with leeches. Okay. And it was muddy. Gale was sliding and we were descending. So can you, and even if, even though I had my hiking sticks, can you imagine how painful it was for my feet <laughs> to constantly, constantly hitting the front of the shoe? My feet were in agony at this point. And I was wondering, how on earth am I going to make it to the Mafia Fall? <laughs> so I was like, whatever. So we got to the junction. We parted ways. They went, they went to the next camp. They arrived at the camp by 1030 at this point. And I just kept going. It was muddy because the rain, it was raining so hard the night before. The rains only stopped two hours before we started heading off. So we head off at 630. The rain stopped at about four-ish a.m. in the morning. So. I was like, okay, let's go. So I, I'm like, you know, I'm like during the times I was descending, I was taking it slow. And I had this song on repeat playing in my mind. It's called Oceans. And it goes like, you know, spirit, uh, spirit lead me where my, um, when my trust is without borders, take me deeper to where my heart, to where I could not have wandered or where my feet fail me or something like that. And it, it was this, this was a big moment of growth where I realized I, this past month, this past year and a half, I really, just go by faith. I just go by intuition. Where I feel the nudge to go and to leap, I take the leaps of faith. I've taken so many leaps of faith, not knowing where I was going to land or what the purpose was until later. And it's been tiring. It really has been tiring. But somehow or other, every single leap of faith I have taken, I have landed in paradise because I trust. Because I trust and I believe that I'm going it's, there's a higher purpose. It's taking me where it is that I need to go. And where I am right now, I am exactly where I needed to be. And then having this song repeat as I was trekking, I was looking around me and I thought, you know, if I didn't make the decision to go to Sydney, and if I didn't make the decision to come back to Malaysia, I would not have this. I wouldn't know to come to this trek because this trek was suggested by my mom. She was giving me all the best all the best attractions to get me to come home and to get me to stay, you know? <laughs> and here I am, cocooned by beautiful, untainted forestry. This is where I was meant to be, you know? And even though my feet were hurting, I had faith that I had to keep on going. And so this was where the mental resilience, the emotional resilience, the psychological resilience, the spiritual resilience started setting in. It was like, I need to finish. And then, I went on for what seemed like forever. And because the storms last night was so much, some trees had fallen down and we had to clamber over some trees and that didn't help my feet either. And it was just like, oh my freaking God. And when we, we got to, to, the, to the point where we started descending, this 700 meter descent, which is now 700 meters descent, just has to be our like trigger warnings. It took about an hour. How can 700 meters take an hour? So what it was like, it, it, it took an hour and it, this hour felt like forever. It felt like forever. It felt like no matter how low I went and I went so slowly, I could hear the waterfalls, but it seemed like I could never reach the bottom. That was what it felt like. And that whole hour, I felt like I was just in tears. I was going to burst into tears for two reasons. Because number one, my feet were in so much pain. I just wanted it to be over. Number two, because there was so much pain, I had to move so slowly. And I think that was the part that hurt me the most. It was, I couldn't bear to move this slowly. I just, I, I don't move this slowly in general. And I just had to keep going because how I was already so close. I thought that it's went back now. I, there is no way. So finally, I was so tired. I was, I was on the brink of tears for so long. When I finally got down there, all I did was take out my phone, take one video, and I sat down. Can you imagine? Like, if you put in this much effort to go somewhere, you want to take photos of yourself, right? 
you want to take photos of yourself with a beautiful view, whatever, because you work so hard. But for me, I was like, I was done. Like, I just wanted, I just, I just wanted the whole, that segment to end already. So I just took one video. I didn't bother eating lunch. I took off my shoes, all of those things. And if it wasn't because my guide was telling me, Andy, come on, let's take a photo. I'll take a photo for you. If it wasn't because he offered, there would be no photos of me at this waterfall. But, 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 there would be no photos. But, but the, the, this photo is also going to be, when you're older, it's going to remind you of the hard, hard work you did to get there. Yeah. 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 And it did. When I look at this photo, I feel so proud because I did it. Like I went through so much pain, like in every way, not just physically, in every way to get to this area, to get to this point. When, when the other people, when the other people in the group had bailed on me, they decided, nah, I'm not doing this. So it was just like, I felt really proud of myself. I didn't feel it at that time. Because I was just tired. I was just tired. I was in pain. I was relieved. But then there was also the fact that, shit, I came all this way, but I have to go back up. I have to go back up. So but, All that way to go to the camp. So, so how long did you then stay at the waterfall? Just like for half an hour or? I stayed like an hour because the guy had lunch there. And we took some photos and stuff like that. So uh, uh, I didn't have lunch. I was just... It was you and the guide in the end. The other two didn't. It was just, didn't enjoy. It was just me and the guide. And what is really beautiful is that in everywhere I've gone to, whenever, somehow or other, whenever it's just me and someone else or I end up alone, really magical things happen when I'm alone. Like amazing things happen, com happen when I'm alone compared to when I'm with friends or whatever. I don't know why it just happens that way. And on the way back, there was, I cl climbing up was a lot easier because you know, it was my heels sliding back as opposed to my feet sliding forward, right? And as I was going up, I already knew the pain was still there, but I already knew that I was going to be losing easily three or four of my toenails. I knew this already. Ow. And as of this morning, one tone, as of this morning, one toenail has already come off completely. And it's just a matter of time before the other three come off. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Welcome to my life, Oliver. Welcome to my life. <laughs> oh my god like you, so, you're a woman talking like oh whatever i'm gonna have like two or three donuts i mean how many women can yeah, talk like that um probably not many not that many <laughs> i mean you cannot have them <laughs> you cannot have them nicely red or blue or whatever you want to have that oh my god so yes the constant hitting made it black and yeah yep. Um, yep yep and then I, I realized this as I was going out, clambering more, but I had like beautiful conversations with the guy. The mist started coming in and then it left and it made the forest look so magical. So magical, somewhat scary as well. And then after that, the mist left and then the rain came. So I hiked in the rain. And honestly, in that one day, I got to experience so many different atmospheres in the forest. Whereas all the other times, it was just either sunny or nothing. You know what I mean? Well, hot, but this time it was really, really beautiful. So we arrived back at the junction and I'm in so much pain. And then now apparently we have like another 700 meter descent and a bit of a walk to head to the next camp. And I was just like, I just wanted the day to end at this point. Honestly, all I wanted was the, for the day to end. So this was another slow descent. And every time we hit a corner, I think we're there and we're not. And I go to another corner, I descend somewhere and I thought, okay, we're there, but we're not. And then we go to, we arrive at the bridge. And I was like, oh, it must be at the end of the bridge. It's not. So you keep going, you go up, you go down and we hit another bridge. And it's like, oh, it must be there. And it's not. And at this point, I'm like, I want to cry already. Honestly, I'm just like, so oh, I'm like, honestly, using it at this point, my feet are in so much pain. I've been hiking for, I don't know how many hours. Okay. And then finally, the guide was like, okay, Kittle, we just go up this hill and we go down and that's the cap. And I was like, okay, so let's go up this hill. So I go up this hill expecting to go down. And then I see, I see that, I see the cap. And I was like, wait, this is the cap? And I turned around and he's got his phone up and he was like, yeah, this is the cap. And I burst into tears. I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so Ryan was like, this can And Gail and Marcus, they come out to greet me and they were just like, well done, Andy. I'm just so proud of you. How are your feet? And I told them like, let's about the whole story. And it was, yeah, it was a whole thing. And I, I couldn't even walk really well on the wooden, on the wooden slats, on even the even slats at the camp because my feet were in just so much pain, but I did it. And I hiked about 10 and a half hours that day. Wow. 16.5 kilometers, 10 and a half hours. And the message that I got, oh, I forgot to share when I was going down to get to the waterfall. And I was on the brink of tears. The message that I got was, Andy, can, can you let this be enough? Because I wanted to go fast. I wanted to come back to the camp at a particular time. I wanted to beat the record, right? Because that's my ego. I want to, because I, 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 I hike fast and I want to beat the record. And the message that I got must have been from a higher self or from Gaia. I don't know who it was. It was like, Andy, can you let this be enough? Like you're in so much pain. You ha if you have to go at this pace, can you let this pace be enough? Like, what is the rush? Why do you need to get to the finish line at a particular time, at this arbitrary time that you set for yourself? Can you let this be enough? And the reason that was so significant for me is because that applies to so many other parts of my life where I'm always rushing. But I want to get to the destination when really it's the journey. So if you want to talk about growth, in every sense of the word, that was growth. That that day was growth. Yeah, so that's that's why you told me as well. It's like a lot of integration needs to be done uh, when you communicate it and ask it yeah. to move the date for for having the sec that is into you. Yeah, you know, that's, that's also why I yeah. thought you might have gone out and do some meditation and journaling uh, because you said you have so mm -hmm. much to integrate. But it basically was. You pushed through and I can really see this masculine and pita energy, right? It's like, I have my plan, I yeah. have the day, the time, how I do it, when I do it, <laughs> what I will experience. And so it was probably a lot of hits for your ego to, you know, like to let go. As you yeah. said, isn't that enough? Yep. Can you let that be enough? The speed, whatever you do, yep. enjoy it. And as you said also before, it's like, you miss the, the things on the side. You, you're focused. You, you, like, like what yes. they with man, we get the focused eye and we, we don't see what's left and right because we really don't. We are aimed when yeah. we drive the car or we yes. run or we bicycle or whatever. We only see this. We don't see the people shouting like, hey, hey. We just go there and then like after it's like, hey, didn't you see me? Like, no, when, where? No. <laughs> yeah, I was there I was raining exactly. like, seriously so that's what is apparently typical for man um, to have this focused view because of hunting because of getting the mm. food for the family if you want to mm. believe that that's what we did for 300,000 years which I don't but, <laughs> <laughs> but I still think I feel like that could be an interesting topic to dive into I mean, next time. <laughs> I, I still believe humankind lives still and lived in nature where the men were hunting, but I think even mm -hmm. female warriors were normal, and we just think the female warriors don't exist. But generally speaking, going back to women and men, women are better in in feeling the energy in a room. How is anyone related to yes. anyone? Where are the dangers? Where's the blah, blah, yes. blah? Because, and so they have more the peripheral overview where the men are normally yes. more looking like, where's danger? How do I, you know, how do I get out? Focus. How do I protect the people, me and the people of my family, which are important, yeah. right? So th these are the different energies. But I can really, in this discussion I have with you, see this very masculine, or I, I just see Pita because I'm in this Ayurvedic class now, like, very yes. focused, very goal oriented, and um, you kind of let go. You kind yes. of break it down, and you try. I can see you really try to say no, 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 no. Let it flow. Divine timing. Everything yes. comes. Don't be in control so much. And yes, yes. This is this is something that I have been working on all this year because it's natural for me to. You're like, oh yeah, let's go do this. Let's go do this. I'll do this. This is how this went. And so, 
so many times this year because I told my friend that I don't want to just be like that car where it's on or off and the on is like super high speed. You know what I mean? I want to have zero, one, two, three. So this year I have been working on that. So now I'm feeling, I'm feeling really good. Like I flow so much easier now. And like every time I feel the desire to do something, I check, is it like, well, is this really what I want to do? Or is this good? My mind is saying, oh, this could be like, is this, this is something that you want to do or to keep busy or just to, for the purposes of doing something. Because if I'm doing something, I don't have to feel, right? I don't have to do the deep introspection because I'm busy. So it's like, so it's like this year, that's what I've been doing. And I have, I'm, I gotta say, I'm so proud of what I have achieved this year. Honestly, I'm so proud. Now it's no longer zero and one. Now it's zero, one, two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so, so you go closer and closer to, to cruise control as well, instead of control life. Yeah. Um, is there having flexibility? Yeah. Having that flexibility to go slow or to go super fast. And that's what I want. I want to be versatile. And I think I've got that. Yeah. It's like, like learn to cruise because life happens and there's nothing yes. to control. And then there's life happening for you, perhaps in a, in a way where, you know, now I have to speed down and get things done. Um, you yes. Know, as I don't, I haven't mentioned that I met you through Isha Patel, which I interviewed. She gave me a few names and you were one of them and um it's also she also said like she was just working hard 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 but it didn't feel working hard and this event just happened and a lot of people just showed up and it felt like it didn't feel hard but when you look at it she was working she was pressing down the pedal yes. and working on the marketing and connecting people and doing all that stuff but it didn't feel like work and then after that it's kind of like yes. let's go off the gas pedal and just like cruise through life enjoy the moment see the sunrise see the sunset see the bees the birds feel the grass yeah the wind whatever it is right and then suddenly this inner mm -hmm. as we talked before this inner thing comes up this inner seed comes up which was wants to grow and then you can start putting the gas pedal a little bit and then perhaps press it down again when 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 you need to work yes how is it yes for you when i say this with these different speeds the cruise, the g little bit of speed, the gas. How does, you know, living Swiss, living in Denmark, we have seasons. <laughs> I don't know how it is for where you are. <laughs> uh, if you have like the rain season and the not so much rain season, uh, because you're more closer to the equator than I am. I'm much further away. So you have like a winter and a spring and a summer. And I can see for whatever strange reason, I start to, do lots of interview now, August, September, October, even though I said, no, no, I want to have time for myself. And now people ask me like, oh, when do we have the interview? I'm like, what is going on? I, I know September to December is actually the time for me to really slow down and actually go more okay. centralized, more, more ground. So then in January, I can start working. But I know in, in, since I'm in Denmark, January, February is terrible for me. There's like no energy doing, but I know or my belief is, let's put it that way. My belief is where I am. So January, February, March is basically where you start putting out the seeds. So then April, May, June. That right, makes sense. Uh, the things can grow so I can reap it for mm -hmm. July, August, September. And, you know, enjoy what I did. Where then September, October, November, or like October, November, December is more the, um, relaxing, you know, the cruise control. Just, you know, you don't press the yes. pedal, you don't do anything. You just go and feel, you just enjoy, you go walking in the nature, you, you enjoy some good food. That's kind of where I am. Uh, or that's my belief. Perhaps I have it completely wrong and I'm going against my inner, whatever, biological cycle. And I just have it all wrong. And actually October, November, December is for me, like go out and just do all the work, right? Like I do now. And two years ago, I started the other podcast which was exactly the same time yep. november december a lot of interviews yeah. a lot of work i'm like how is that coming so how is it for you do you feel like you have like typical seasons during the year or it's different um i know in australia we have seasons we have like you know summer summer autumn spring winter all that kind of stuff 
To be honest, I haven't really been following those seasons. Um, the only season that I've been, I, I feel like, I feel like my seasons go year by year. <laughs> so like, like, like 2021 was one season in itself where I'm breaking out and doing adventurous things. And last year was the season of like rest of like pure deconditioning, focusing inwards. And this season I am reaping. <laughs> I am reaping, but at the same, reaping all the benefits, but at the same time, I'm also preparing, preparing from this place of reaping. I am gaining more clarity and preparing for, for sowing new seed from a better place in the coming year. Um, so that's, I haven't really looked at it from the perspective of, you know, every three, four months or whether it's October, November or January, what that looks like for me. I haven't looked at it that way, but as a woman as well, because, you know, you know, every time we have our menstrual cycles, that is a death and rebirth. It's a release at the same time. So what I've noticed for me, I have this release at the time of the menstrual cycle. And then after that, for the rest of the month until the next one, I'm in the process of building up towards creating something and then the next release and then the next rebirth happens. So mine, the one that I take notice more is year of, is month by month by month. And when I look back in the past few months for the rest of this year, that has been the trend around the time, around the time of my menstrual cycle, I would have made an important decision or taken a particular direction, or I've created something, something always happens around right at the time of the menstrual cycle. Oh. And that it, that's when I know that something has created, something has been building up to this, and now it's time to release and rebirth and renew. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and that brings me to the question that once in a while I hear that women don't really talk about these things. And, um, you know, with the menstrual cycle. Oh, do you mind that I talked no. about it? No. <laughs> no, but I... Can... <laughs> I kind of thought, like, whatever. No, 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 I'm no. just going to say, and then you can, you can cut it out, like, if you know, if, you, if it wasn't, like, appropriate. Or no, something. It, wasn't, it wasn't a judgment. It was just an observation. Uh, do, you, no. do you talk to your girlfriends about these things? Do you do they see the same kind of cycle? And the, the next question, when it is a cycle and it is a, a lunar cycle, I mean, I've been talking to an Aztec Indian, a native a Mexican, mm -hmm. and he talks about these lunar cycles. And in our world, in our civilized world, women are not really following her cycle with the moon. Yeah. Because and of I all the different anti- it. Blah blah blah, pill, anti baby pills and whatever, whatever, all the chemicals we put, plus the food, right? Uh, also for us men, all yes. these sterilized whatever meats we eat. And how is it for you? Do you have a natural cycle with the moon? Do you realize, oh, it's a full moon, it's the new moon? Because I can feel the moon, uh -huh. unfortunately, which is not so good. Today it's full moon, and my energies the last two days were like super depressed. And that's what happens with me. It's like letting go of this, I'm not good enough. I'm I don't deserve, I cannot have. That's kind of like my cycles every month. Is, is, that, is that the thing that's been coming up? Like, I think is, so, is that I'm part very of the thing depressed. that's fueling the thought? I, I, I'm feeling very mm. depressed around full moon. And I, I had talked with my mm. friends and I'm not looking up on the sky. So I'm not influenced by, oh, it's full moon. I try to write uh, down on my mm. journal, like how I feel. And then after the fact, go like, is mm. it full moon? Is it new moon? And I see it's very much like these two days before, two days after, I can feel it. So how is it for you now that you opened up with your monthly cycle? Do you, do you, is your menstrual cycle aligned with the moon or mm. not? Okay, wait, first thing before we get to that, I want to <laughs> say now that you, now that you mentioned the, what comes up to you during like full moon and lunar cycle and stuff like that, it made me realize that my final words of wisdom that I gave in the first segment it's so relevant. <laughs> oh, I it's like I didn't realize how relevant that was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize how relevant that was until you said that. <laughs> That's how it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
And that came from the heart too. It's not like I thought about what was the best thing to say. Like that was just the one that came up. Okay, so menstrual cycle. Um, my menstrual cycle, I feel like there was a period of time that, oh my God, my menstrual cycle has lined up with the full moon. <gasps> oh my God, my menstrual cycle has lined up with the full moon. Oh shit. Okay, wait, wait, okay. <laughs> let me have this moment right now, okay? So I'll be honest. I, I was that person that had like the contraceptive, like the, 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 the IUD, the one that is inserted inside you. Yep. And then you don't, you don't get your period for like five years. That was for me because I saw my period to be the most inconvenient, annoying thing ever. And that stems from women being very disconnected to our bodies. And especially when we're masculine, right? So because I was so much in my masculine, I hated, like, I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile and I couldn't flow with my cycles because the cycles of a woman, sometimes you, like, there's a period of time when you are very creative, you're energetic, and then there will come a point where you go into introspection and you kind of have to be taking slow a bit. I couldn't stand that. I don't like being slow. So, and I thought, you know what? Let's just stop the period completely. That I don't even have to bleed, right? And I can just keep going. I just keep going. Just keep moving. Until, I know, until last year, I just suddenly felt this nudge. I suddenly felt like I want to take it out. I want to take the IUD out. And when I got that removed, I had this, now I have contrast. And I realized how numb how i had numbed myself you know what i mean and for what purpose did i numb myself because i didn't want to deal with having a period i didn't want to deal with the inconvenience of being a woman i didn't want to deal with the emotions of, that comes with being an intuitive medicine woman you know creative nurturing being so that was a big moment there and since that time i i, I don't really follow like astrology so much but i know that Whenever it's full moon, I feel a particular way. I feel like I need to move. I need to dance. I need to move. I feel like there's excess energy that needs to be released. My, the, the menstrual cycle doesn't necessarily fall on the full moon all the time because it's, it's always like 28 days or something. So it, it changes every time by a day or two. But the past two months, it's been late by two weeks. Last month, it was late by two weeks. And I'm happy because if it wasn't late by two weeks, then my period would have arrived on the first day of my trek. And there is no way that I could have completed that trek whilst on a menstrual cycle. It would have been impossible. It, it would, it, I would not finish that trek. Like, fact of the matter. No matter how, how slow I went, how hard I tried, I just wouldn't have had the energy for it. So I feel like my body was like, Okay, you know what? You need to have this track. We'll delay, we'll delay the menstrual cycle for you. But this month, oh no, wait. Yeah, yeah. So last month, but this month, it was late again by 12 days. So, but now that I'm talking about it, as I said earlier, it's arrived at the time of the full moon. So that's today. How amazing is that? That's today. It arrived today. I was ready to explode because it's like, come on, this, what needs to happen? What else do I have to create? What other decision, pivotal decision do I need to make like to have this release? But it's, it's happened today. Oh my God. We are God. talking already for more than three I, hours. So yeah, I mean, it's, I just looked, I mean, it's almost soon four hours since we talk. So you have. Oh my gosh. Do you have to go? <laughs> not no uh, i just okay my dog is in heat so before. she's in heat now she should be over it uh i thought like four okay. weeks ago it started so like whatever but i wanted to go in the forest so she can run right she can be free and that was my plan for today and to eat something and i said you know what um i was also in this controlling energy we talked about um, don't press it and that's also so if you feel that you need to go you can just go. But if you feel like you want to keep going, we can keep going. It's like it's completely but it's beautiful. up to you. It's beautiful. I just need to go in my bathroom again. I'm, I'm struggling with going so much in the bathroom. And according to the Ayurvedic Indian medicine, uh, 
going yeah. out on the water has is connected to the vata, to the air, to the thoughts. And I'm so vata is air. Vata is the air, ether, um, the thing in between, the thing which holds the things together. When we talk about yes, quantum yes, theories. yes. And so for me, I'm in this balance with vata. I have more vata than I should. Because when you look at my hand, okay. right, I have like really, I have shovels, my feet as well. So there's like the kappa, that's the earth element, the water earth element. Mm. Uh, my intense look, the little bit of reddish, the, the strength, the speed, that's my pita. That's the fire where I can, when I look at you, I right. be a lot of pita. I had curly long, <laughs> I had like, cur you see, I have like curlyish hair. I had like thick curly hair. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm, I'm, I'm in all elements pretty leveled out. Um, yeah. My teacher thinks my, my vata should be below, but I have like the bones, which can crack. I don't know if you heard that one. Especially. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. My back. My ex-wife hated it. Um, and my son can do it as well because he has vata. Vata is air. So the bones are light. They crack, right? If you have pizza. So crack is good. It, that's a natural for vata people. It's a part. If you have right, if you have dry hair, which is always breaking, that's vata. It's air, but it's like thick right. and okay. oily and lush. That's earth. And if you have like uh, okay, so I think I've got earth then. <laughs> well, we we can look at that. Then then the Chinese have the traditional Chinese medicine. They also use metal and wood inside. But oh yeah, the saying goes that the traditional Chinese medicine comes from Ayurveda. When it moved from India mm -hmm. up to China, they adapted it and added and subtracted, you know, acupuncture, uh, acupressure, uh, herbs, teas, all these. Uh, th it, this is something which is fascinating me, but I know so little and sometimes it's frustrating. Um, if you think you know so little that I know like even less, <laughs> like I'm learning, like I'm like I'm finding all this like really interesting here, and you talk about it. Yeah, but uh, now you say for three years you're down this spiritual path. For me, that was in 2019. I heard about Ayurveda. I know I actually heard mm. probably 2016, 17 when my Ayurvedic teacher, his daughter was going to Bali, and my daughter and we met, we talked, and then there was one mm. class here and there, but. Going deeper into it was in 2019 with the doshas, right? With the, mm. that's the doshas that are the, and then you have also Agni. It's the fire of digestion and uh, the healing and all that stuff. So it, it and, yeah, and then you yeah. have like the, um, the mental levels, um, sata, sattva, I think, sati, sat, sattvic. And the other one is like when you're, in harmony with yourself, and that looks different for a pita person, looks different for a kappa person, looks different for a vata person. Then you have like the mm. disbalance where you're like, uh, right? Like where you have too much going on, like the fire almost. And then you have the one which is almost yeah. like the earth where you are lethargic. And depending on in which elements you are, that will look all different to you. But the goal is to yeah. be in satic, yeah. it's being in balance. And Yes. Balance yes. doesn't mean to be in earth, water, fire, air in the same level. It means to be according to your divine design, right? Your divine design oh. is different than oh. my divine design. And being in balance means to it's, live yeah. from that, in that divine balance, from that design, right? So if you're a Vata person, you're a thinker, you're whatever, you might have long, thin fingers. Not so thick hair, dry skin, mm. very long legs and everything. That's you. Gee. Don't try to be a pita. Don't try to be a kappa. But it's always to be in mm. balance. And when you're not in balance, then the diseases come in mind and yes. body. Yes. And all, you, you right. I love this Asian way of thinking of health. Um, mm. And then you can be in, the, I mean. The it's very holistic. Yeah, it's holistic and the, the physical, and that's why I ask you, did you have any diseases, a stiff neck, a headaches all the time? It comes all from this, this balance. I, I have a lower back pain since I'm 19 and like, I have no idea what to do, but it's probably not being able to carry the burden I'm, I'm carrying mentally, emotionally. And we have all these different bodies. I mean, this physical body is very easy, right? That's the body, right? You can feel it, but you 
many people can understand the emotional body, right? Like you said you were crying mm. when you realized you cannot really move when you were your brother. So that's like the emotional mm. body. Then we have also the electrical body. We talk a lot about this, this the meridians uh, and all these things. We have the astral body. Mm. We have the spiritual mm. body. I think yeah. there's seven bodies and I never can, I have not yet been able. I, I can never remember it all. And I don't know which one is the sequence. Because yes. it's like, it, it gets bigger and bigger. There's a sequence. And I, I can never remember which one comes first and to what does it extend to? I mean, the physical body is the last one. It's the most dense. It's the most, it, the, where the energy is really like so dense that you can feel it, right? I cannot press my hand through the table. I, yeah. Some people say yes. they, yeah. when you are so enlightened, then you can, right? You can just move through a granite wall when you're that enlightened. But I haven't seen it, but I've heard people have seen stuff like that. So that's going back to magic. Yeah. So I personally didn't see it, didn't experience it. So the most dense body is the physical. And that's the last one where the diseases yes. are visible. So if your mm. spiritual body has a disbalance, if your emotional body is in a disbalance, uh, that that's at least... It's going one. to manifest itself. It's manifesting in your body. And that's what we know definitely also in the Western medicine. The body, the body keeps the score. It's like when the emotional yes. body is disbalanced, you're always tense, stressed, anxious, whatever. It will manifest as a heart disease, as headaches, as tension, Absolutely. as cancer. Um, I don't know. Why, why, why did I go that way? <laughs> well, you were just following the flow of what you felt like sharing. Yes. And, and this is, I, it's interesting. It's educational. Yeah. So for you, that's something you haven't really dabbled in, I can see yet. No, I have not dabbled in it like at all. I, I haven't felt like, I haven't felt, because like, everything that I've been to, everything that I've dabbled in or everything that I've gotten into, it's, it's not things that I can do research on. It's just if I feel the pull. Or like, or something, or someone presents the opportunity to me. That's how I know that it's meant for me, and that's how I know that whatever that is meant for you is going to come to you, <laughs> and whatever that it's not, it's okay that it's not. And so Ayurveda clearly is meant for you because you've been deep diving into this for some time now, and it's it's a huge thing. It's it's not only Ayurveda. I, I really can, beneficial for you. I I can see. I'm now had this Aztec Indian, right? This Native American from Mexico yeah. and listening to him is so interesting. Uh, last year I was traveling for two months, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and I met the Sami. Sami yeah. are the indigenous people from Lapland, from North, you know, the ones with yeah. the reindeers. And I've been talking to two of yeah. them and I'm so fascinated. She didn't really want to share. I mean, we talked for two hours, so I learned a lot. But she didn't really want to go deeper in healing and all these things because she thinks we white people, mm -hmm. we are just, you know, misusing them. And well, we, to an extent, that's true. Um, <laughs> he, history shows it's true, but there's many of us which want to reconnect with who we are. How can we yes. do that yes. if we cannot go to an indigenous person or culture which still is connected? to the divine mm. nature of being and and listening to her listening to the other guy in a in a matter of one year apart shows this a lot of the teachings are the same mexico and finland how is that because mm. there's a, a, a knowledge all around the world so going to the aborigines in australia would probably give similar feedback you know, like it's the grand. Yeah, oh no, I totally believe that. Right? It's the grandmothers which teach the small kids. Yes. And it's a grandmother for many kids. It's not like necessarily genetic grandmother, but it's the wise one, the wise woman which is mm. teaching. So the other ones can work and, 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 and giving responsibility from small kids. I mean, the Sami person told me like two year olds get sharp knives. Why should they not have that? Wow. You have to teach them how to use it. I guess if they've been I guess if they've been taught, yeah, trained and taught how to use it properly in a practical sense. Because you're in nature. So you need to cut things, mm. you need to get things. And and we are pampering our kids. Right? They could injure oh, yes, themselves. They are. That's why all of our kids have allergies. 
Oh, goodness. Yeah. All right. I feel like today has been really lovely. Like, thank you so much for your time and for like having me. I really enjoyed this conversation and I think it flowed so easily from topic to topic to topic. It's been fun for me anyway. Yeah, that that's apparently something I'm, I'm able to uh, enable or to create a space for uh, when I have guests. Um, I've been told many times people have been sharing things they will have never shared to anyone or just to the very close person. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but uh, apparently I'm doing something. You're just being you. And can that be, can that be enough? Ha! Yeah, that's, uh, that's another thing. Like, I'm like, how long will, will she talk about her trip to the jungle? But um, it was an hour and it was interesting to listen. It was an hour. I hope I didn't bore you. Was it interesting? No, it's like really the path for you. It's like the growth. It's it's really a journey which was compressed in in a five day journey, but it is a journey I've been taking for a long time. And as I said, what I can see as a if I coach you or if I give feedback, it's really this this masculine energy of of controlling everything and having all the plans or the pita. You know, like this, ha I want to compete. I want to be the fastest one to go through that path, even though my toes are falling off and I'm bleeding and I can barely walk. Uh, right? So it was really beautiful. Yes. And also to see um, that you took these different classes and you just moved from here to there and from being a lawyer and you, you were not having a bad team. You liked the people you work with, but it was not the right work. And, yeah. and I didn't have the feeling at all that you were a victim of my mom did, my father did, my my brother, my friend, my boyfriend, I have no idea, my boss, they did. You never had something like that. It was always kind of like, I put myself there. So you had like this inner guidance uh, or or feeling that it's not the outside world, which is something doing to you, it's your actions. Do I get that right? Mm, so you had that absolutely. always that feeling. That yes. You always knew it's you which can change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, there was a period of time um, when I was unconscious where before I got into personal development, where I feel like, oh, you know, I am in this situation because of, of my childhood. So there was some blaming there at that point. But then at the same time, I also know that, look, I'm an adult. You know, at every decision I make now as an adult, I can't blame it on someone else. <laughs> you know what I mean? What kind of person would I be? You know, and it's liberating to take responsibility of my life, to take responsibility of my decisions. And then when I started having and built, when I started becoming more self-aware, becoming more conscious, when I started getting into personal development, I started taking even more responsibility back. Responsibility that, I couldn't have known how to take before that, if that makes sense. I can only take so much, but now I can take so much more and now I've just taken everything back. And it's liberating, it's empowering. Everything you want is within your own fingertips. Everything you want, you can create. But you also, it also means that you, all, you have the responsibility to deal with the shadows and to transmute any darkness as well. It, it, it's, it, it's both, it's everything. Yeah, for me, it's like, when I get into these full moon cycles, I feel like I don't want to take the responsibility. I don't have the energy. I, I cannot lift myself up, right? But yeah. I've heard from so many. I with, get that. I get that. Many say like, yeah, but it's so liberating because you are in power of, of changing everything. So for some people, I think yeah. there must be a balance. Uh, on one point, it flips where, where you're so tired of being tired of not having the power, even though you know you can change a lot of things. I mean, you can start with the perception of the situation you're in. As you said, acceptance of yeah. uh, of the now. I, we talked about it, but did we come to a conclusion? How, how do you accept yourself? How do you accept the situation? Yeah, actually, now that I think about it, I don't think we ever, we ever touched on how I did it. Well... The best way would be to do it yourself and to not have the universe 
force you into a corner by making you sick or, or like to put you in a position where they have to humble you for you to accept. It could just be something as simple as sitting in, like just sitting in, sitting in silence for me anyway now and just, you know, having that intention and saying to myself, I accept that this is where I am and actually feel your whole being and your whole body accept, not try to rush off somewhere, not try to go towards somewhere or to avoid something, to just be with whatever that is, no matter how uncomfortable it is and to be with it in love and without judgment. Yeah. yeah. So that's how I, that's how I accept it is to be able to do it with neutral observation. And it's important to do it um, with in a state of neutrality, in a state of non-judgment, because it's so common for us who want to judge, right? It's so common for us to be like, oh my God, this feels terrible. I shouldn't be in this situation. I want to get away from it. Why am I, why am I so stupid? Whatever, whatever, whatever. All of these things that our mind just drums up and it just, it doesn't help the situation when really we could just stop judging. And it, it, maybe it requires, depending on how easy or how hard it is for you to do it, maybe it helps if you could just detach, like kind of like take yourself away from that, situa- from that situation. Just look at it from a third party view and be like, huh, okay, that, that it's just what it is. This is just the situation at the moment. We just got to accept it. And when we're ready, we we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's where I am, right? Like, condemning myself for where I am and focusing on what I don't have. And as I said before, jumping from however I want to live, right? From a big, nice house Mm -hmm. or a condo to a car to whatever, or just not having anything, but just move from one place to the other and just work uh, doesn't really help. But this is so important to just be in a moment. And I think the best thing, working for me is like doing this meditation as you said drop into your heart space mm. um, yes. you can do pranayama you know just focusing on on, on the nostrils work. breathe in through one nostril breathe out through the other and slow down as mm. much as you can box breath four seconds in four seconds hold four seconds out four yes. seconds hold or yes. and then you can increase that as well to six seven eight seconds each mm. these are like ways of of calming down and again, going back to Joe Spencer, he's like, whenever it's hardest, you need to do it. And yes. His yes. pupils, the, the pupils he saw, the biggest changes were the ones when they didn't have, when they were so depressed or so hurt, they didn't have the energy to meditate and feel better. And they still sat down for one, two, three hours and were sitting down and just meditate. That's also what Isha Patel told me. She was meditating for one and a half years before anything really happened. She was yeah. connected before, but the big changes came after constantly meditating every day. So, yes. which then brings me to the question I wanted to ask you before we were dropping out suddenly is, do you have any morning routines you do or evening routines which help you to connect more with yourself? I do my meditations in the morning. So in the morning, I wake up, I get my coffee, I drink my coffee because that's like my, my, my therapy. <laughs> You know, it's, it's my Zen therapy. And then I sit down, I hold two crystals, two, two of my favorite crystals in my hand. And I just sit there. I connect to my heart space. Um, you know, and yeah, recently I've been connecting with Jesus Christ because I'm in the process of thinking about what I want to create. And actually, I want to ask you, I want to ask you, and you have to answer from your heart. Okay. How does love want to express itself through you? Love through me. How does love want to express itself through you? What does your heart say? And whatever it is will be it. No right, no wrong. It just is. So so the first two words that came, first was love, right? Like share love and be. Love, like that yeah. and the second was creativity and the second was creativity like like um you know visual visual art or something like that <laughs> but, but that came later and i know it's like this two three seconds it's normally the intuition 
Yeah. And the first thing was love. And I'm like, okay, but that's what you ask. How does love want to express for me through love? Like, okay, that's a bit too general, but I think it's just be nice to people. Yeah. And, and like, so love can look like anything, right? That could look like being kind to the person on the bus stop. That could look like being, that could look like looking after your dog. That could look like smiling at the cashier at the supermarket. It looks, it could look like anything. Yeah. It could look like what you're doing now with the podcast. This is an expression of your love, right? Or I yeah. think is an expression so, of love and creativity, both at the same time. Yeah, for me, it's like, and, and that's kind of the feeling I have. Like now I agree that we have interviews, so I don't want to back down, even though I feel like because I made a commitment and then when I have the interview, I want to give the best that it looks good. And then I spend too much time on it. I feel like I'm spending like 15 to 20 hours on a, on a podcast. I'm like it's, it's not needed, but somehow I want to give like the best I can for my guests. So they are standing on the best ground as I can offer for, for them when, when it's published, when it's on YouTube yeah. or, or on Spotify, Apple podcast. So I, I don't know what, if are. that's love. I don't know if it's love or, or, um, or you feel like you're yeah, not like, doing enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the, this is the process. Like I don't, yes, yes, of course. Like, like you said, when you were on Instagram or wherever you were, yeah. uh, I feel like I have to have like one episode every three days and I have to have the reels, the shorts, uh, clip. Ba, 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 and then I'm just crushing and I feel like in a little prison and I feel and I don't yeah. want to do anymore because I have also the pictures and the paintings here which want to come through me and I push them away yeah. uh, and, and, and that's when we talked before it's actually already getting dark it's two o'clock and like what the heck is going on afternoon it shouldn't get dark <laughs> yet. Or, uh, it feels like it's getting dark but I really felt like, okay, after this podcast, I'm going to eat something good. Perhaps I'm going to have the ice cream with banana and chocolate cream. And yes, I'm, you I'm should. Gonna... You should. But I have to you find, should. I don't have banana or vanilla ice cream. I need to go shopping for that. So, but I want to paint, right? Paint on the painting I did for my kids and on the little stones and just forget about the podcast because now I already spent four hours on it. So how many more hours to want to spend on one thing when I have so many other aspects of life which wants to express through me. And everything comes in a good time when it's ready. It's like letting go of this. Okay, so let's just, coming back to this particular podcast, when would have been the ideal time? When would have actually been the better time to stop? Because I know you said, like, let's just, let's, I'm, I'm not talking about other podcasts, specifically this one. If, if, if you had it in your mind, like, okay, you know what? This is the boundary that I'm setting for myself. And I, and I feel like this is good enough already. I have, I feel like this is good enough already. What time, when would it have, when would you have had it stop? I mean, Planning. After two hours, if, if, if about that, that's normally what I do. Two hours, but that's already in the mindset, right? It's like when I go into the podcast, you have I have the mindset two hours, boom, um, which is dangerous. So why are we Be here at four? Why are we here at four? Oh, because sure. we just, I just followed it. I just flowed. The questions came. I'm like, I, how can <laughs> I stop now? And have, um, there's more coming. There's more, right? It's like. There's this, there's something which I have to feeling. There's something missing and it's not feeling bad. It's feeling actually good in the body because I feel like there's something more. Uh, that needs to be expressed. Yes. Like I, I feel like, hmm, I think Andy has more to say and I'm just asking because after two hours, let's close down. And then I just had another question and it just like continued. Okay. 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 So, so then this is good. So then this is good. I just wanted, cause I wanted to ask if the continuation of this podcast, was it feeling, I want to see if it came from a good place, if it came from a place yeah, of creative flow, a creative flow, or is it like a, like a, 
oh, I want to make sure that I give her like the best platform and like, you know, no, make sure no. there's all this content. And so I want to keep it going, even though, even though I want to be painting, yeah, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I want to make sure it came from a place of love. I was like, yeah, it, this it thing is going, with... I still wanted to ask, you know? But we forgot to go on the beach and take a picture anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were in the flow but i can music. feel now that we are getting when you ask about the flow so i feel like we we have talked about what we need to talk about um yes yes so it, it feels right so to close it down so we're not prolong it i look on the watch and like what the f it doesn't feel like that long because yeah right i felt like it it flowed very well so, so don't get me wrong, but I can feel like um, it's about time to close it down. Well, in that case, I have... really hope that your I hope that your your followers really like get a lot out of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I mean, so yeah, much was shared. Oh yes, and there's more to be shared, right? Uh, depending on what, how deep we want to go. But um, <sighs> let's see. When, when we already said where to find, like two hours ago, we talked about people finding you on Instagram when we were about to close down first time. Um, so what are you doing? It's like, is it like a one-time healing session you do with the people or is it like a coaching? Is it like a guided path journey you offer? What are you offering to the people? I do, at the moment, I do one-off healing sessions. Um, I have this program. It's just, it's called the Free in Three where people can come to me with a specific, with one particular specific problem. And then we release the emotions and change the beliefs around that, on that one particular specific problem. So, and another thing that I've been looking to do with the shifts that's been happening is I want to be able to take people out to like the beach or to somewhere and just like meditate in nature connect to Gaia and feel the land. But of course, you know, it would have to be someone who is Malaysian or someone who is like here in the same city. But those would be, yeah, those would be my offerings. If there is someone who needed like a, a longer program, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind creating one depending on how, whether it felt aligned at that point. But for the moment, it's just one of healing sessions or the free and three. Okay, super. We are going to mention that all in the show notes so people can have an overview. And we put it to all different sections we, I decide to do in the end, if it's two or three or four sections of all this long talk we had here. So that's perfect. Yes. So I say thank you, dear listeners. I probably have to say several times for staying with us. And I hope you got something out of it <laughs> with all these different things. There's nuggets everywhere. Um showing in and let's see how good my editing is so perhaps i can pull out some nuggets in in the form of short clips or reels as i try to do and um, yes, else it was also a lot of good storytelling and tips and tricks so thank you so much so please people go to andy or me send private messages click share like all that great stuff so people can get this kind of content Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Bye.